Well, with another offensive line commit, offensive commit for the Bruins, the offense is going to have to carry UCLA in 2023. Let's talk about it. Locked on UCLA. You are locked on UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey everybody, it's Zach Yedders with the Oxheimer. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of Locked On UCLA. Thanks for making it your first listen each and every day. It's free where we get your podcast. And if you're watching on YouTube, thanks for watching. Thanks for support the comments. Hit that subscribe button. Thank you very much. In the meantime, this episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. They help you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Again, linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. In the meantime, another week goes by, another day goes by, and UCLA and Chip Kelly gets another portal commit, this time from one Kadir Kunta, a transfer from Old Dominion, as UCLA gets a three-year starter using his COVID year to come to UCLA, a left tackle that will replace Raekwon O'Neal, a 6'6", 300-pounder, the fourth offensive line commit for UCLA, the second via the transfer portal, and then you have a third coming from JUCO, and then you have a fourth coming from the class of 23 straight out of high school. So UCLA slowly bolstering up and filling in the gaps and holes with the offensive line in addition to the tight end position, wide receiver, quarterback room, running back room. And all of a sudden you run out and you realize every position Chip Kelly has had to fill, whether it was a big fill, um, a little necessity, or something he thought had a gaping hole offensively. Chip Kelly has gone out and filled it one by one and found ways to make this offense potentially as lethal as it was this most recent season. And it was still pretty dynamic in 2021. Don't get me wrong. But the last two seasons with DTR and Charbonnet and Britton Brown in the backfield for one of those years with Greg Dolchich, the 21 year UCLA has on paper, Look, what looks to be one of the better offenses in the Pac-12 and one of the most dynamic offenses, again, across the country. Who steps up? Who's the starting quarterback, running back, receivers? You can choose your pick. That's not what I'm here to say. But again, between Kyle Ford recently, J. Michael Sturdivant, Carson Steele, you'll go get even another Anthony Atkins. That could be a you know big upside later. You know What they already have, UCLA, between what they've already brought in, will have an offense that will suffice and become a dynamic team that scores 30-plus, 30 35 points per game. That's in my perspective, and each and every pickup Chip Kelly's gotten has been offensive-oriented, at least this so far this during the transfer portal with it being open and closed and getting commits. They did get a couple of key defensive transfers, but not enough to convince me that the defense will be anywhere near good this year. They can be opportunistic. You can see across town how... Everybody didn't like Alex Grinch, but they're opportunistic, got interceptions, and that put them into a top 10 conversation, arguably a top four conversation. UCLA at times, the first six games under Bill McGovern, before he had that little leave of absence at the end of the regular season, the Bruins are also slightly opportunistic, finding little diamonds in the rough, finding a Leatu Latu, finding the Murphy twins. So it gives me, beyond just those three players, there's more that were good and guys who can grow. But it gives me an idea that UCLA might be building more towards the class of 24 and building more defensively later. There's not been any other than the Christian Dunbar Hawkins commit as their first class of 24 commit over before the weekend. That gives me thought that UCLA is really thinking, hey, it's last year in the Pac-12. If we go with Dante Moore, we might have a freshman QB. We want to compete but they might just want to be good and not great. You never know with how crazy back and forth the Pac-12 was this year in football, especially UCLA, who knocked off what ended up being, what, a couple of top teams could have knocked off even more and had opportunities to have an even greater season. Chip Kelly, it seems like, all right, let's just go and see how the defense plays. Maybe see how Bill McGovern does without the talent to see if it's worth retaining him longer. Or with him maybe being at the end of his contract, 
Who knows what it looks like going into the Big Ten, and maybe they reshift their focus defensively. For the Bruins, they sit here. Offensive line looks set. They've got their replacements. They have Spencer Holstedge. They've got now Kadir Kunta. All the replacements on the offensive side. But again, defensively, little pieces here and there, which either means one, defensively, they have what they like. They're going to develop talent, which Chip Kelly has done. Develop talent and put it on the field and put guys into successful positions from where they were walk-ons earlier in their career. You can think of a Hudson Habermill. I'm just blanking off the top of my head. But there's other guys who have gone from being walk-ons to key contributors in Chip Kelly's UCLA tenure. Is that what he expects on the defensive side of the ball? That's a lot to ask for Bill McGovern and his defensive unit. Does it make me confident in 2023? Does it make me confident in 24 that, that their first commit was a defensive commit? Yes, it does make me and then many Bruin fans happy. Yet UCLA still has to prove they can go out and get some more defensive guys. Roderick Pleasant still out there with all his speed, a four-star DB that's got UCLA in his final five. I know some of you guys say he's going SC, he's going other places. Until Chip Kelly has proven so far this offseason that until someone commits elsewhere, you know, UCLA needs and has a chance to go get another defensive key, albeit a true freshman, but someone who can help in the secondary. Will the Bruins get it? We don't know just yet. But it's nice to see the offense is set, will be explosive, regardless of who starts at each position. I would say the offensive line, for the most part, seems a little bit more set than the rest. But overall, UCLA offensively looks good. Defensively, could even be more of a question mark than last year coming in. Who knows? But they do have key pieces that made big plays last year. And now what will they do with some a second year under their belt, some who are much maligned, and other guys growing into roles with a Jordan Anderson coming in, Oluwafemi Oladejo coming in. Those are two of the key defensive guys. You have Jake Heimlicher, and then UCLA can try and nickel and dime their defense, but that's not a way for success unless you're just saying, hey, we're going to go put up 50 points a game and just outscore everybody to go potentially compete for a Pac-12 championship in their final year as a Pac-12 member. Not sure how that's going to lead to success, but we just have to wait and see when spring practice comes around whether it can get a final commit or two before the second signing day. Those are all questions that wait to be answered. But the Bruins get a boom, a late commitment, and they continue to build through the portal. Chip Kelly's like, hey, we'll get a one-year stopgap here. We'll get guys who will build for two to three seasons there. Either you trust him or you think he only knows offense. We'll find out. In the meantime, speaking of trust, do we trust the Bruins in the basketball terms on the men's side that they're going to go forward and they can be competitive after they had a big marquee matchup Saturday afternoon against Arizona and failed to win that. I'll give more things of what I did or didn't like between them and the Cats. And then UCLA could have been amongst the top of the country based on the most recent polls and how bracketology has been shaping up. What does this mean for the Bruins heading deeper into the end of the season, the regular season? We'll talk about that after I tell you about LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs. Just know that as a small business owner or hiring manager, that all your success in 2023 may depend on the team, will depend on the team members you surround yourself with. That's why with LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire those qualified candidates more efficiently by matching the people you want to achieve your goals with. Those skills, values, experiences, you can attract qualified candidates with targeting tools. You have screening questions that can help you connect with potential qualified candidates faster and for free. You can screen, rate applicants, all on one platform. Small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find those qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Move it on here in the second segment of Locked On UCLA. Thanks for tuning in. Talk to football because they got the latest recruitment news. And you just kind of wake up some days and you're wondering, is there going to be a commit today? You wake up, you see a boom. You're like, who is it? And it's the boom tweet. And then they get the offensive line commit. Kandir Kunta, again, he started 25 games in a row his last two seasons for Old Dominion. They didn't play in 2020. He's been a, almost a three-year starter for the Monarchs of Old Dominion. So for the Bruins, stopgap, replace Raekwon O'Neal's left tackle, and that's where we go. Now shifting the focus over to basketball, UCLA, 
man, frustrating Saturday. You get through a grind of a late Thursday night matchup in Tempe against the Sun Devils, a back-and-forth game. UCLA on that late 16-2 run gets the win and beats the Sun Devils by 12. In the comments of the reaction, some of you may or may not agree, but I wasn't too impressed with Arizona. Obviously, in a college basketball year where there are no clear great teams. I'll detail that later in the podcast. There's no great teams. You could argue UCLA is not one of those great teams. And this year, it'll be a good team to win. It won't be an all-time memorable team that goes and wins it. Last year, you could argue Kansas, who was a one seed, was under the radar all season long and went out to beat the hottest team in the tournament. So who's that under the radar good team? Is it UCLA right as they're about to burst on the scene? As Mick Cronin said, we've been flying under the radar only to lose in a packed atmosphere in Arizona. I saw there's some statistics. UCLA took a lot of quality shots. They had open shots. They just couldn't make them. Others might say Arizona hampered the U Arizona defense, the UCLA offense. And we've seen UCLA's offense have lulls against every opponent, which is the scary thing for UCLA because this is the type of game they can lose in the tournament against a quality opponent. I wasn't impressed by Arizona, but they're still a quality team with a good coach, some size down low as college basketball turns back the clock in the days of the big and has good things where UCLA does not. Depth at the size, low post, and the Bruins didn't make their shots. All recipe for disaster for UCLA in March. But still, UCLA, without Amari Bailey, looking to get Will McClendon a little healthier as he builds into a continual role and finding any production from the bench is what's truly what plagued UCLA. Losing 58-52 to Arizona, a game where they trailed by three at the half, led the majority of the first half, only to see a late Arizona run at the end of the first half, give the cast the lead going to the locker room. They were tied at 26 after an early Tiger Campbell three, and then Arizona just blitzed the Bruins. Large portions of that second half, Arizona wasn't pulling away, but UCLA just could not make a single shot. How desperately terrible were they shooting the basketball? In the second half, UCLA, 3 of 11, 27% from downtown, 2 of 5 from the free throw line, 34%. To go along with the first half where they shot 9 of 32, under 30%, and barely made 10% of their threes. Any of the scores between Campbell, Hawkes, Clark, and Singleton all had to horrible, horrible shooting performances. Campbell, 5 of 18. Jaime Hawkins Jr., 5 of 17. Jalen Clark, 4 of 13. Those guys all got double figures, including Triple J and then Jalen Clark, the two Js there, double doubles. And then Bona at the end, where they're just lobbing it to him, had a very quiet game, battled severe foul trouble early, and then at the late run was able to get himself into double figures. But it was surprising to see UCLA not get any production out of Singleton, who you can have your off night shooting, and it was. It was just a poor time when they needed a three. A three that could have kick-started an earlier run, maybe put UCLA out in front late in that game with a super crazy long run at the end. Instead, the Bruins got nothing from the three-point shooting from Singleton, McClendon, and Andrews. Those guys went a combined 0 for 7. And with Jaime Hawkins Jr., who is not the most high, who isn't the best percentage three-point shooter, he went one of six, so you're not going to win many games if you're watching Hawkes have to shoot a lot of threes. When he's open and he can make clutch threes like he get, did against Arizona State, that's good in rhythm, but him taking six threes wasn't the recipe for success. The Bruins, again, have not turned it over more than, an op than their opponent. It's just they go through stretches in games where they can't shoot the basketball, and there's not really ways to explain it other than Every single game, even when they've dominated and completely obliterated their opponents or when they've dominated the mid-majors, UCLA goes through cold stretches that are just kind of puzzling. You can't really solve it. And then someone goes, gets three steals like a Hawkeyes or a Clark late, and they just turn into layups, and their shooting percentages go up. Their offensive efficiency goes up. And then with the way Singleton's been shooting, you kick it out to him. He hits his three threes, usually from a high quality percentage and the UCLA efficiency goes up. They average 70 points per game, large part due to defense and then turning it into offense, which is what maybe made such an angry Mick Cronin at the end of what their post game radio interview, all the, most of the post game comments while he did give some credit to Arizona. It was just a frustrating performance because you saw how many teams went down in the top 10. 
We'll get to that soon. But UCLA had their opportunity. A win, and you're in the top four. Top three, you're a one seed, and would have clearly been a one seed. A loss, and the Bruins have bounced from what was number five in the country on the verge of breaking through and being on the one seed, and then bouncing back down to eight, which still, you know, depending on selection committees and the polls, Bruins are about a two to three seed right now with a very tough road game at SC in the toughest stretch where UCLA had at ASU, at Arizona, and at SC all in a row, one, a top 10 team, and two, who are scrapping and clawing their way to stay or get into the NCAA tournament between the Sun Devils and USC. So not a tough stretch by any means. UCLA still so going over to Colorado, Utah, host Arizona and Arizona State again, and then go to Oregon one more time. And who knows what Wazoo will bring. Again, things not to like. Without any bench production for UCLA against good teams, they're not going to win big games. They have the ability to win without getting it. They can survive. But against Arizona, they got four bench points. And this was a game where Singleton didn't shoot the ball super well. When he did, the Bruins, they won by 12. Or I shouldn't say won by 12 against ASU, but they won that game, considering it was a late four- to five-minute run that put the Sun Devils to bed. Against Arizona, couldn't shoot it. Of course, you're going to key on Singleton. He's put the numbers up where you face guard him, you don't let him get clear open shots, and you force him to take fall-away contested 30-footers. A little exaggeration there, but contested super long NBA range shots, turning away from the basket. More often than not, even as good as red hot as he's been, the Bruins aren't going to win those games. And then with no production whatsoever from the bench, right? Nuba came in, 10 minutes, picked up four fouls. You can argue about how, whether some of those were credible or not, but he picked up four fouls really quickly. And in the end, had four fouls, only two rebounds, no buckets down low. Andrews wasn't his dynamic self as he was against ASU. Goes from zero points after a seven-point performance. McClendon, nice couple of buckets. The only bench production whatsoever for UCLA. And none of the starters could buy a high-percentage look and bury at the same time nobody. Campbell, Hawkins, Clark, all couldn't do anything. And then Bona struggled in foul trouble. UCLA cannot win games with teams like size with Arizona. When Bona's in foul trouble... And no Etienne playing, who knows why that is the case. And then Nuba picking up foul trouble. I mean, Etienne did play, yes, but not as many minutes as he probably could have, depending on his health. UCLA, they've got to learn to win these big games. They've had some big moments, destroying Maryland, beating Kentucky, on the road, neutral sites, winning Pac-12 games until this one. And it just sucks that they don't get to play Arizona earlier in the season. I would love to play... Arizona at home in February in about three weeks time and see where both teams are. And then if they met in March, have it be in the Pac-12 tournament as opposed to play them at the end of the regular season and then maybe meet the next week. And, you know, maybe UCLA will be hot. Maybe Arizona catches fire and proves me wrong. That could all very well be the case. But I would like to see how they would have looked in three weeks time and then see how they looked three weeks later when it came to the Pac-12 tournament in Vegas. We're not going to get that. And depending on what I've heard from the schedule, UCLA is actually not even going to the McHale Center again in their last year in the Pac-12. So the Bruins, good riddance, aren't going to Tucson unless they schedule a a home-and-home non-conference or a road non-conference game in the future like the Bruins did this year with Maryland. So that was the last chance for the Bruins to win in the McHale Center, barring a late change in next year's Pac-12 schedule. And again, whatever you think, the Bruins had their opportunities to win this game. Cold shooting in no bench production aren't going to do it. Bailey, we need him to get healthy, and UCLA can come and get the win. Now transitioning into furthermore, what does this mean across the country in this third segment of Locked On UCLA? I've kind of been teasing. This last week was going to be Carnage Week. It was Carnage Week. What do I mean by that? Carnage Week? College basketball is just going to get wiped out with all the crazy matchups, the top 10 teams going down. Here's a list of who went down in this last week alone in the top 10, only the top 10. I've mentioned teams here and there, but we're going to go through who lost in the top 10 last week. Number one, Houston lost. Sunday, depending on what you consider the beginning or the end of the week, Houston lost at home to Temple, their second loss. Some might have considered them the clear number one after what's been happening. That's not the case. They lost at home to Temple. 
You had number two Kansas pick up two losses at K-State and then get obliterated at home by TCU. Number seven, Texas lost to Iowa State, who was the 12th ranked team. And we'll give a little bonus here. Iowa State then lost on Saturday after beating Texas. Number six, Gonzaga lost their lengthy home winning streak and their winning streak against unranked teams, losing to LMU at home by a point. Yet Xavier, who lost on the road by a point to DePaul, who has a losing record. And then you had UCLA, who lost to Arizona. So if I can do my math, because I forgot to do it, one, two, three, four, five, six teams in the top 10 fell last week. More than half of the teams in the top 10 fell. And even Purdue was barely scrapping by as they almost lost to Maryland, I believe at home, in a three-point game, which would have been huge considering if Maryland gets that win, UCLA gets a much bigger resume building win if Maryland could have beat Purdue transit properties there. The teams who jumped in front of UCLA in the rankings, Arizona, you get beat by the team. They jump, same amount of losses. Makes sense. K-State, big week, two losses, beat Kansas, scrap away on the road. They move up. Tennessee, I feel like Tennessee is a very puzzling one. One, because Tennessee's above Arizona, who Arizona beat. Tennessee's lost to Kentucky, Arizona, and Colorado. And two of those three teams UCLA beat by double figures. So I don't know why Tennessee's higher than UCLA. But either way, to talk about how crazy this year has been, Purdue, who's now the new number one, lost not too long ago in the last two weeks. Arizona has lost two games in the last couple of weeks prior to the UCLA game. You have K-State, who before their big matchup against Kansas, lost to TCU by double figures. So it just shows you that this revolving door is always open for UCLA. It, they have the opportunity to win a championship this year. You can see why they can lose early or not make it, but they have the ability with the tenacity. If the Bruins can play like they did those last couple of minutes, where they went from dead in the water against Arizona, those last couple of minutes against Arizona State, those first 20 minutes against USC, the Colorado run, how they scrapped it against Utah, a full game against Kentucky, how they just straight blasted and beat down the likes of Maryland on the road in that mid-December week, way back when, now over a month ago, UCLA has the ability to go out and do it. But then they've showed how they lost to Baylor, who's gone out of the top 25 and now bounced back to number 15. You've seen Illinois been all around, all over the place. And now you've seen Arizona, who showcased, hey, I still think UCLA is better than Arizona, but you go on the road, a top 10 environment, in just the matchup, top 10 environment across the country. It's tough to win on the road. It is what it is. I still think UCLA is better than Arizona, but Arizona did enough to beat the Bruins. It wasn't their best game. It wasn't, excuse me, UCLA's best game. But both teams still have things left to prove. Arizona, they want to prove that they belong. A lot of their early wins, like a lot of early UCLA wins, we don't know how good those teams are. We don't know how good the Bruins in Arizona are. They have capabilities of being tough matchups, Arizona with their bigs, UCLA, which is their sheer tenacity defensively and their grit and their skill between Jaime Hawkins Jr., the reliable veteran in Tiger Campbell, and Jalen Clark just surely, ah, let's get a steal every 50 times you know, in a game, so on and so forth. The Bruins have the opportunity to go forward. You win that game against Arizona, you could have been a top three team. I could have argued maybe as high as number two, because they would have had two losses just like Alabama. You could have argued the Bruins could have jumped over Houston, who fell from one to three. Alabama jumped all the way up to number two. I could have argued with the win at Arizona, UCLA would have been slotted as high as number two. Losing to Arizona, you saw teams, you saw pollsters who had UCLA even out of the top 25 completely. So you just see how just up and down, back and forth, this college basketball season can be, will be, and will be a journey for UCLA. Again, I compare this team to that 2018-19 Virginia team. I really feel like if they're going to go on a March Madness run, five of their six games, it could be in the first round against a 15 or a 14 seed, maybe a 16 seed, it could be a second round game, all the way through if they make it to the Final Four National Championship game, even to become a champion here for the first time since the mid-90s. UCL will have to grind and find ways to win. These games, like they lost to Arizona when the pace was dictated, 
in a style more favorable to the Bruins than it was to Arizona, UCLA has to win those games. And in a game where it's at some point will be a high tempo, higher scoring game, where at some point I think UCLA will give up 70 or more points again this season. I don't think they're only whole teams to under 70 points every single game, but two, they're going to have to learn how to shoot and score the basketball to win a couple of games as well. They had their opportunity. They had their chance. They blew it. But, you know, you'd rather do it at Arizona in front of a crazy crowd who's got the respect where Arizona State hasn't built as much respect and credibility as Arizona has this season and over the years. But you got that win at ASU, and then you continue to build, and you get their second your second crack at them at the end of the regular season. A weird place for that game to be. You'd rather have that game be against, like, a Washington or a Cal or a Stanford. But UCLA will have to settle for waiting more than a month plus to play Arizona for a second time before maybe a third time a week later. Who knows? Bruins had it. Could have been as high as number two instead or nearing the end of a two or three seed, which can make that route to a Final Four even tougher this year. Again, at this moment, the recording of the podcast, there is no update in terms of Amari Bailey's health. We will see how his foot and everything looks like going forward. In the meantime, thanks for tuning into Locked On UCLA. Go check out Locked On College Basketball. Make that your second home or second listen for all college basketball news across the country. Isaac Shade, Andy Patton, they got good hosts. They got it all. UCLA fans, get your hands in the air. Eight clap time, baby. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. U C L A. UCLA fight, fight, fight. This has been Locked On UCLA. Zach Anderson, Yoxheimer signing off. Go Bruins.